Welcome everybody to this morning's presentation. Um, this is the second last day of our first ever online summer school and thank you for everybody for your patience so far with our problems. It is my pleasure this morning to introduce to you Chris Danziger. Unfortunately, we're having a slight technical problem and we can't see him, but we will be able to hear him and see his presentation. Christopher Danziger has been lecturing at summer school for the last, I don't know, about since 1976, when he gave his first series of lectures at the summer school. For the last 15 years, he has been a tutor in the Department of Continuing Education at the University of Oxford. His special interests are in Napoleonic France and Roman of Russia, on both of which he has written extensively. Without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Chris. Thank you, Zelaga. Uh, is everybody hearing me? Do I assume everyone's hearing me? Perfectly. Okay. Perfectly. Okay, yes. Let's carry on. Um, well, today's talk is all about the amazing recovery uh, that Germany made after the Second World War. And as you see, the, the lecture is entitled A Phoenix Arises from the Ashes, and then subtitled Germany 1945 to 2020, um, but that actually is slightly misleading because the phoenix that arose from the ashes was already there by 1955. In other words, it didn't take them 75 years to arise from the ashes. It actually took only 10. By 1955, Germany was already a powerhouse, not necessarily a superpower, but certainly a powerhouse. Um, now, the amazing thing is, how did this happen so soon to a nation which had been utterly devastated at the end of the Second World War, almost obliterated? And after the First World War, you may remember, some of you, that uh, people believed that Germany hadn't really been defeated, um, it was mainly that they'd been betrayed by internal traitors like the Jews and the communists. Um, but after the Second World War, no one could make those claims any longer. First of all, there was absolutely no doubt that Germany had been utterly and totally defeated. And here is a very famous view of Berlin, which was known as the City of Eyes because all the windows of the buildings had been blown out. And uh, not a single public utility could be made to work except with the help of the occupying powers. And it was impossible to blame internal traitors like Jews or communists because Nazi Germany had long ago purged itself of all disloyal elements. And the leadership that had once aroused such blind devotion had either committed suicide or been taken prisoner while trying to avoid capture. But it was much worse than just military defeat. As the last sorry, year... Chris, sorry, Chris. Yeah. Are you moving your slides? I'm not seeing them. Uh, have you moved to the next slide? Sorry to interrupt. I'm just checking if people can see. Are you moving to the next? Have you moved to the next slide? I'm on the second slide now. Berlin, the city of eyes. Can everybody else see that? Yes, yes, I we can, can see it. Yes, 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 we can see it. Good. We can see okay. it. I'm just going to go on to the third slide now, which, as I say, it was much worse than just military defeat, because in the last weeks of the war, the full horrors of the extermination camps were revealed to the world. Um, Belson often gets the most publicity because it was still intact when the Allies liberated it. Auschwitz, for instance, had been abandoned by then. And for the first time, the Germans were made to confront exactly to what sort of wagon they'd hitched their stars. This wasn't just defeat. It was desperate, unmitigated disgrace and shame. And of course, uh, the Allies made the Germans do the clearing up work you know, which brought it home to them, particularly how brutal the regime had been. But over the whole of post-war Germany, chaos reigned. In some cities like Cologne or Dusseldorf, 
less than 30% of the housing stock was inhabitable. The economy was totally non-functional. There was no central government. About 8 million displaced persons were trying to find homes which no longer existed or to escape being resettled under non-German governments. And it was really left to the occupying powers to restart the German economy and political life. They had to deal with shortages and in some cases total absence of food, fuel and housing. They had to restart public transport. They even had to open schools. But all these measures didn't have an instant success. A year later, in other words, in 1946, the daily food ration in Germany was a thousand calories a day, compared, for instance, to the British wartime austerity rations of 2,800 calories. And even by 1948, it was only 1,500 calories a day. Interestingly, the British had expected that control of Germany's industrial heartland would be a financial asset, that in some extent it would pay for the costs of the war. Instead, simply to keep it going, it cost the British 80 million pounds per year. Now, the massive task of reconstructing Germany's cities began by clearing literally mountains of rubble. Now, the highest point in Berlin, which admittedly is not saying a lot, is a place called Teufelsberg, which means Devil's Mountain, which consists entirely of rubble carted away from demolished buildings. And uh, now they've put a NASA monitoring station on top of it, which makes it look quite spectacular. But of course, uh, in its first 20 years, it was just bare earth. And most German cities have a similar memorial, such as the Schuttberg, uh, which is Debris Mountain, in other words, in Stuttgart. And the war had left Germany with 7 million more women than men. So the massive task of clearing that rubble fell largely on German women. And they became known as the Trümmerfrauen, literally rubble women. And virtually no machinery had survived the war. So almost all of it had to be done by hand. Materials were so scarce that every brick which could be reused was set aside where another team cleaned it and made it serviceable. So I'm just trying to paint a picture of a society that's reached absolutely rock bottom. Now, meanwhile, Germany had no option but to accept the political decisions made about their future by the victorious powers. And in 1945, the four victorious powers met at the garrison town of Potsdam, just outside Berlin. And they met in a palace which had been built quite recently for one of the minor German royals called Schloss Sicilienhof. As everybody says, it looks a bit like a minor British public school. Um, and um, that's where the uh, four powers met to decide the post-war fate of Germany. And can you see my pointer? Well, you can't answer. Here you see Clement Attlee and his foreign secretary, Ernest Bevin. There you see Stalin and his foreign secretary, Molotov. Here you see Truman and his foreign, sec foreign secretary, Burns. Um, these are the people who are making the decisions on which Germany's future rests. Now, most of those decisions had already been pre-decided at the Yalta conference in February. And Germany lost large swathes of land. You can see them here on the map in the white sort of shading. Um, approximately 25% of its surface area on its eastern borders. These were the areas which had long been disputed between the Germans and the Poles. They now reverted to Poland, and of course, they are still Polish today. And as you can see, the remainder was divided into four zones of occupation. Um, and the Soviets took over the eastern sector, but Berlin, as you can see from the map, was regarded as so important 
that it was decided that that too should be divided into four zones of occupation, which is why it has this multicolored little sort of entry here. And many Germans who are under no illusions about what life in the Soviet sector or the recreated states of Poland or Czechoslovakia would be like for them, about five million Germans picked up whatever they could and headed off for a new life in the Western sectors. Now, it was also agreed that the, that the Russians could remove from the Eastern sector 15% of all reusable industrial capital equipment. In other words, thousands of German factories were dismantled and re-erected on, on Russian soil. And the Western zones then transferred 10% of all their industrial capacity to the Soviet sector. All Germany's armed forces were abolished, as well as all munition factories and any other industry which could support them. All ship and aircraft manufacturing capability was destroyed. Steel production was capped at 25% of free war levels. Car production was fixed at 10% of free war levels. But actually, all these measures were relatively lenient compared to the Morgenthau plan by which the US Secretary to the Treasury had advocated pastoralizing the German economy. This was thought to be the way to prevent Germany from rising again. Even trees were exported from the American sector on a large scale because of the perceived war potential of German forests. However, before anyone starts developing feelings of sympathy for the Germans, remember that they were living in an earthly paradise compared to any of the people who had lived under Nazi control during the war. Anyway, I have tried to convey the totality of a society and a state which had reached rock bottom. But we know that it was only a matter of years before Germany had made up all the ground that she'd lost. Within one decade, she became the fourth largest economy in the world. And two decades later, she was the third largest. How did this extraordinary transformation come about? And how did it come about so quickly? Well, I don't intend to belittle for a moment the hard work and ingenuity of the German people. But the answer to that question really lies again in the presence of communism. Many of you will know that communism was a crucial part of the explanation for the rise of Adolf Hitler. Germany would never have voted for him if he had not seen, dangerously extreme though he was, their best defense against the growing threat of communism. Then 12 years of Nazism turned people's minds. It turned out that Nazism had been a worse danger than communism. The capital West, capitalist West was even prepared to ally with communism to defeat Nazism. The war extinguished Nazism, but communism emerged stronger than ever after its role in defeating fascism. Post-war Europe seemed to be at the mercy of communism. All the states of Western Euro Eastern Europe became Soviet satellites. As Churchill said, the Iron Curtain stretched from the Baltic to the Adriatic. Even to the west of the Iron Curtain, Communist parties became the largest parliamentary parties in Italy and France. In the Far East, the communists won the 20 year long civil war in China. Across the world, communism seemed to be winning the ideological battle. The cooperation of the wartime alliance turned sour very quickly. Within a year, Russia and the Western allies had fallen out. British and American suspicions of Russia's intentions became steadily darker. By 1947, there were only two countries east of the Iron Curtain, which were not yet absorbed into communism. One was Greece, if you're following my pointer on the map, and the other was Czechoslovakia. Um, 
In 1947, uh, in Greece, communists and monarchists were fighting a civil war to decide who would rule their liberated country. In 1947, war-ravaged Britain announced that it could no longer afford to give support to the monarchists. In the USA, President Truman felt that action could be put off no longer. He announced the Truman Plan, promising to support, as he quoted, free people who are resisting subjugation by armed minorities or outside pressures. You notice that he doesn't mention communism by name, but uh, everybody understood that that was what he meant. So the US then took up the fight on behalf of the Greek monarchists against the Greek communists and actually enabled them to win that battle. Now, Truman's Secretary of State was even more alarmed by the direction the world was taking. And he believed that without a massive injection of capital, the stable conditions could not be created in which democratic institutions could survive. And there you have General George Marshall, uh, who had been a very successful military commander and had now been co-opted onto Truman's administration. And he proposed a donation of $28 million. A donation, this is a donation with not many strings attached. And the only strings attached were that um, countries benefiting from it should allow American companies to operate there, not necessarily on favorable conditions, but they should allow them to operate in those countries and that they should, they should be willing to share technical secrets. So he proposes a donation of 28 billion. The American government discussed it for a while and then scaled it down to 17 billion. Congress then discussed it and scaled it down to 4 million. Then it suddenly decided to scrap it altogether. It was too generous. When suddenly there was a communist coup in the last remaining free country in Eastern Europe, Czechoslovakia. So, in a panic, Congress suddenly rushed through a first instalment of $4 million. In the end, about $15 million was donated. And its effect was as much psychological as financial. And where it was applied, it tilted the balance in favor of capitalism. Now, there was some debate about whether Germany should benefit from the Marshall Plan. What swayed the argument was that the free world would need Germany's economic strength to combat communism. Incidentally, um, the terms were so favorable that even the Russians inquired about whether they could benefit from the Marshall Plan. But when they heard that it, had to, that it meant allowing American firms to operate freely in America, uh, in, the, in Russia, then of course they decided to turn it down. So here we have the amazing uh, situation where a country that was defeated two years earlier is now going to benefit by massive financial donations from the victor. And by a freak of chance, Germany was uniquely well placed to benefit from the Marshall Plan. The point was that in Britain and France, Financial aid kept old factories in business and restored old-fashioned public services. But in Germany, there were no old-fashioned factories. The pre-war infrastructure had either been destroyed or it was irrelevant, like railway lines that led to nowhere. So most of the funding went into state-of-the-art factories and new communication systems. By 1950, perversely, Germany was in better shape to compete in the post-war world than any of her wartime victors. Now, in 1948, which was the year that the Marshall Plan was first uh, put into operation, the temperature of the Cold War sank below freezing point over disagreements about the future of Germany. Britain and the USA 
started preparing for a union of their zones of occupation. And in June, that's June 1948, they announced a new currency, the Deutschmark, which would apply to their, which they said should also apply to their sectors of Berlin. Now, the Russians claimed that this was an interference in their zone of occupation. So in retaliation, the next day they closed all access to Berlin by road, railway or waterway. The Russians calculated that the Russians would soon give the Russians calculated, sorry, that the Allies would soon give up on the effort of supplying West Berlin by air. But the commander of the US forces in Germany, Lucius Clay, said, reckon it had to be done. He said, when Berlin falls, West Germany will be next. President Truman said, we're going to stay, period. So the Allies set to, to the process of supplying Berlin by air with every single one of the necessities of life for as long as it took. They knew that the Russians could not take the risk of being the ones to start a war by firing on Allied aircraft. And of course, why did they know that? Because at that time, the West had the atom bomb and the Russians did not. So the Russians couldn't risk that provocation. So it was really a matter of who could last the longest. Now, food was the item which attracted the most publicity. But what constituted 65% of the total tonnage of the airlift was the much less glamorous matter of coal. But Berlin also needed petrol, diesel oil, heavy machinery, medical supplies, clothing and drinking water. At the height of the crisis, a plane landed in Berlin every 60 seconds. Altogether, 277,800 flights were made. And you can see that the plane in the picture is very proud that it had made 1,383 flights and it had delivered 128,000 tons. Um, the airmen came from the British Empire and the USA and France, but the airlift could not have worked without the help of thousands of Berliners who unloaded the cargo and serviced the planes. The airlift dragged on into the autumn. Winter was always supposed to be its toughest test. Altogether, about 83 people lost their lives, mostly in sort of uh, 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 port accidents. By the spring, it was obvious that the airlift could not be beaten. The Soviets sensed that failure was causing them to lose face. In May, Stalin called it off. It had cost the UK 17 million pounds. It had cost Germany 150 million Deutschmarks, and it had cost the US 350 million dollars. So it was a very expensive piece of ideological politics. West Berlin remained an oasis of capitalism surrounded by a sea of communism. It became a vital symbol of the determination of the West not to abandon its allies. One very important outcome of the Berlin airlift was that the USA and their West European allies decided that in order to be in a state of readiness against any similar future crises, they would set up a mutually defensive alliance called the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. When it had first been mooted in 1947, one of its aims had been to ensure its members against possible retaliation, possible German retaliation. But amazingly, eight years later, Germany was admitted as a member of this North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And here you can see the original uh, members of NATO in dark blue, and there you see in paler blue, Germany admitted in 1955. Uh, and you can see that there are some interesting um, sort of absentees from the, uh, um, from the alliance, for instance, Spain, um, Scandinavian countries, 
they were not allowed it, but of course Turkey and Greece, which were thought to be in a very sensitive place, they were encouraged to become members of NATO. Now, as you may know, the Soviet Union responded by binding the satellite states of Eastern Europe into a treaty known as the Warsaw Pact. So the dividing lines of the Cold War were now firmly drawn up and Germany was one of its prime beneficiaries. It had taken less than 10 years for the hated enemy to become a highly valued ally. In 1949, the three Western powers united their zones of occupation into what they called the German Federal Republic. Its constitution was very similar to the Weimar Republic of 1919. Each of its 11 states had a large degree of self-government, but certain fields like foreign policy, defense and diplomatic relations were reser reserved for the central government. Members of parliament, the Bundestag, were elected by proportional representation which is a system which has notoriously produced small parties and therefore relies on coalitions. Governments are often short-lived. In the 14 years of the Weimar Republic, for instance, there had been 14 governments. So one of the biggest challenges to the occupying powers was to find politicians to whom to hand over power who had no shameful association with the Nazis. As you may remember, it emerged that even Joseph Ratzinger, who became Pope Benedict XV, had briefly been a member of the Hitler Youth. In other words, it was very difficult to find people who had no shameful associations with the Nazis. But in 1949, they were fortunate to have to hand someone who had several times been imprisoned by the Nazis and had lived in hiding from them for many years. And here he is, Conrad Adenauer, that Alter, in other words, the old one, um, looking quite benign, which he wasn't actually, but still. Um, he had been mayor of Cologne as long ago as 1917, and he had turned it into a model city. And after Hitler's war, he briefly returned to that office before falling out with the British occupation, and that spat did him no harm. He was a devout Catholic who had formed the new party, the Christian Democratic Union, in 1946. And in the first post-war elections, he won enough seats to form a government with the help of his allies, the Free Democratic Party. At the age of 73, it was expected that he would be a caretaker for a more permanent figure. However, 14 years later, he was still in office, the oldest person ever to be elected to head a European government. Now, the Adenauer years set, in other words, he was chancellor from um, 1949 to 1967. The Adenauer years set a pattern for post-war German politics, which is still largely intact today. Adenauer was a very firm believer in the Western alliance. He was a firm believer in NATO and later in the EEC, the European Economic Community, and they all suited his politics perfectly. He established excellent working relations with General de Gaulle, which was a very difficult thing to do. And he also established working, good working relations with General Eisenhower. And there's a nice story about his relationship with Eisenhower Eisenhower, like Churchill, was also a keen amateur painter. And as a token of friendship, he sent Adenauer a landscape of which he was very proud. When the US Secretary of State visited Adenauer, he said that uh, he told Adenauer that Eisenhower had been curious to see where it had been hung. Well, taken by surprise, Adenauer said he would show it to him after dinner. He managed to scribble a note to say that he wanted it framed and hung in the next 90 minutes. Then after dinner, Adenauer took him up to a little alcove off his study with a day bed. And there was the painting. And he told uh, the Secretary of State when he needed the clearest head to think of then a painting by someone who was a gifted artist 
as well as the most powerful man in the free world, was an enormous support. Dulles was able to give a glowing report to his master. The loss of East Germany, incidentally, did not distress Adenauer unduly. Adenauer was almost as anti-Prussian as some of Germany's wartime enemies. When he travelled by train through East Germany to West Berlin, he used to draw the curtains of the train when it crossed the border. Now we're entering Asia, he used to say. The official German line was not to accept the division of Germany, but not to agitate against it either. Adenauer's influence was vital to establishing Bonn as the temporary German capital. And here you can see Bonn where my marker is, not an obvious place uh, to administer the new state from. But uh, Adenauer really was instrumental in securing this honor Frankfurt, as you can see here, that was the obvious choice. It had always had a sort of capital status in Germany, but that was ruled out because the Americans thought it was too valuable to turn into a neutral zone. Heidelberg, uh, which is further down the Rhine here sort of thing, um, that was ruled out because Adenauer ruled Heidelberg out because he said no one would take seriously a capital which had been the setting for the student prince. So eventually the choice fell on Bonn, which just happened to be 20 kilometers from Adenauer's home. Now Adenauer's pro-Western stance did not make him into an allied stooge. Some of the post-war leaders were understandably still virulently, virulently anti-Nazi. Denazification had been one of the common threads of post-war policy. Adenauer called a halt to it. He said, enough was enough. If anyone who had had the remotest association with Nazism was disqualified from office, there would be no one left to run the new Germany. The Allies did not want to undermine his new government, so they soft-pedalled on that issue. And as a result, some people with undoubtedly shocking histories were allowed to resume high office as if nothing had happened. However, the most significant achievement of the Adenauer government was the almost unbelievable transformation which took over the German economy during his time in office. And most people give the credit for this to Adenauer's Minister for Economic Affairs, Ludwig Erhard. And Ludwig Erhard uh, favoured something which was called the social free market. And that meant the government standing back from free market capitalism, in other words, allowing it to operate, while at the same time creating a strong social welfare system. Typically, he favoured a strong central bank, which was independent of the government, whose main role was to combat inflation by monetary controls. When Erhard became minister, the Germans were trying to repay their debts with marginal tax rates on, of 82% on anyone earning over the average national income of 2,600 Deutschmark. Erhard reduced it from 82% to 18%, promising that it would yield higher revenues by incentivizing workers. And the German workers bought into this philosophy with hard work and high productivity. Investments started to flow into the country. Marshall aid, of course, provided it with an unexpected boost. And then the Korean War from 1950 to 53 massively accelerated the demand for industrial goods. Germany spent the profits very sensibly on hospitals, libraries, schools, public parks, railways, airports, museums, and social housing, all the things which had been totally destroyed during the war. Economic growth in the first 10 years of Adenauer's government averaged 6.8% per annum. Let me just give you one example uh, to illustrate that growth. After the war, the Allies broke up the giant German pharmaceutical company, IG Farben, 
partly because of its role in enabling the Nazi war effort and the Holocaust, and partly to ensure that it was a weak competitor with their own companies. They broke it first into six and then into four companies. But by 1957, each one of those four companies was bigger than the biggest British firm, ICI. The whole process became known as the economic miracle. Many a miracle has stalled because it runs out of labour. But here again, history came to Germany's aid. So many refugees had flooded into West Germany at the end of the war that there was a massive oversupply of labour. Now that spare capacity was quite quickly mopped up by German growth, so much so that by 1955, Germany was already advertising von Gastarbeiters, guest workers, most of whom came from Turkey and Southern Europe. By 2010, there were 4.2 million people of Turkish descent living in Germany. They have occasionally been the cause of racial tensions, but by and large, they have been a mutually beneficial asset. And suburbs like Kreuzberg in South Berlin are almost exclusively Turkish now, as this sort of scene here suggests. By 1956, when the Treaty of Rome was signed, Germany was already one of the economic heavyweights of Europe. That position has been steadily incremented in the next 60 years. The economy has been exceptionally well managed. In 1949, when the Deutschmark was re-established, one pound sterling would buy you 12 Deutschmarks. In 1999, when the Deutschmark was replaced by the euro, one pound sterling bought you 2.5 Deutschmarks. Inflation was kept very efficiently under control. And apart from the strains of absorbing the backward economy of Eastern Germany in 1990, which we'll talk about in a minute, unemployment has always been low. Germany has, always, has also been the chief beneficiary of the EU, the European Union. It's enabled her to sell cars and chemicals and machineries to the poorer nations of Southern Europe. The euro has maintained the financial value of their payments. The German politician Clausewitz said famously, war is a continuation of politics by other means. I sometimes think that for the Germans, the EU has been a continuation of war by other means. But of course, all these things are easier to achieve if you're producing a good product. And basically, Germany opted, opted for a high quality manufacturing base and it paid off handsomely. Once again, it would have been impossible to achieve without the aptitude of the German work, worker for efficiency and perfectionism. <coughs> An industrialist once said to me, the Germans don't know how to make a bad product. And that is the key to their success. Now, for most of the 20th century, Germany remained at the front line of global politics. Now, the world got a sharp reminder of that in 1961, when the Soviets, in desperation at the brain drain from east to west Germany, erected overnight first a wire entanglement barrier and then later a concrete wall between east and west Berlin. Um, and here you can see it on the uh, right hand side of the picture is West Berlin. On the left hand side of the picture uh, is the famous Brandenburg Gate and Eastern Germany and the Potsdamer Platz. The point was that between 1945 and 1961, 3.5 million East Germans had defected to West Germany. And they weren't just any old 3.5 million. Overwhelmingly, they were the young, the well-educated, and the ambitious. And the route which most of them took from East Germany to the West was via West Berlin, where the full power agreement left plenty of loopholes in the border management. So this was the Soviet answer. Uh, in engineering terms, the wall was a great success. In the next 30 years, uh, escapes from the East from the east of Germany to the west 
dropped from 100,000 per annum to 3,000. There were only 300 attempts, and very few of those were successful, to defect per annum through the wall. But in propaganda terms, the wall was a disaster. The Soviets called it the anti-fascist protective rampart. But no one was fooled. The US Secretary of State, Dean Rusk, aptly described it as a monument to the failure of communism. It was a unique example of a wall built not to keep its enemies out, but to keep its own people in. I went to Berlin several times in the 1980s, and I can remember describing the Germany from West Berlin to East Berlin like going from color television to black and white. When you went through Checkpoint Charlie, you had to exchange 25 Deutschmarks, that was then about 10 pounds, for the equivalent in Ostmarks. It was really a way of raising some currency. The extraordinary thing was that there was absolutely nothing in East Berlin that anyone would want to buy. I thought I would make a dent in it by generously buying lunch and drinks for our whole party of 14. That left me with about 23 Deutschmarks. I bought a decorative ceramic plate. That left me with 22 Deutschmarks. I bought some very good classical music cassettes. That left me with 20. It was impossible to spend the remainder. But from 1961 to 1989, the wall created a fascinating ideological as well as a physical border. Berlin was where you went to if you wanted to see or for yourself what the Cold War was all about. Life in West Berlin was certainly artificial, so the West German government encouraged people to work there by paying them hardship allowances. This was a rather different, special kind of hardship allowance. The result was that West Berlin was dripping in opulence. You never saw a car on the streets that was not a top of the range model. The food hall in the great department store Car de Vie made Harrods look like a kebab van. And here you see a contemporary take on the Berlin Wall. Um, and here is the oyster bar, or one of the 12 oyster bars at Car de Vie. I mean, it was the most sumptuous display of food uh, I've ever seen anywhere. And the fascinating thing was that just across the wall, if you could get there, was the desperately drab spectacle of East Berlin with its monumental high-rise apartment blocks and its long queues for cheap cuts of meat. And it was common knowledge that the East Berlin system could only be maintained by an elaborate system of espionage on its own citizens. One in every seven East German citizens was either a spy or an informant for the, for the Stasi. However, the extraordinary thing was that in the spring of 1989, no one expected that the division into East and West would not be permanent. It was just a fact of European political life. Then, of course, in November 1989, for reasons which lay far outside the borders of Germany, the wall came down. It provoked some of the most beautiful, spontaneous expressions of joy in the whole century. And here you see people just liberated, tearing and smashing this wall down. Um, and of course, just it's worth making the point that not everybody was euphoric about this change of uh, political uh, temperature. I don't know whether you saw the film um, Goodbye Lenin, about a woman who falls into a coma just when the wall comes down. And she's a fanatical communist, a fanatical German communist. And her family have to try to pretend for the remainder of her life that actually the wall hasn't come down. Um, it's a very funny film and a very touching film. Um, but the implications, the long term implications of Germany, for Germany, of the dem demolition of the wall were far from certain. The opportunities for reunification, as I said, were not welcomed by all, either inside or outside the country. 
Francois Mitterrand in France and Mrs. Thatcher in Britain were strongly opposed. Mrs. Thatcher made no bones about saying at a European conference at which Helmut Kohl was president, was present, we defeated the Germans twice and now they're back. The Italian prime minister said, I love Germany so much that I would rather see two of them. However, the Germans themselves were very clear what the majority wanted. The West German Chancellor, Helmut Kohl, immediately initiated proposals for economic cooperation. Even more important, the newly liberated East German Parliament voted for accession to West Germany. Overnight, the ramshackle East German economy collapsed, which made the West German bailout even more attractive. When I say it was ramshackle, I mean, a very typical illustration of it was their famous Trabant car, um, which is virtually the only car that was marketed and uh, used in, where, in East Germany. But of course, as soon as the wall came down, no one was going to buy a Trabant car any longer. Uh, and so, I mean, that factory with the 40,000 people that it employed instantly went into liquidation. Um, West Germany offered a currency takeover at the rate of one Deutschmark or one Ostmark. And as you can see from my previous illustration, it's a lavishly generous offer that East Germany could not refuse. In September 1990, a reunification treaty was approved in the parliaments of both countries by 741 votes to 147. Effectively, East Germany had legislated its own abolition as a sovereign state. And most of the rest of the world supported reunification. Of course, the Russians didn't and the Soviet bloc didn't. But most of the rest of the world supported reunification, including, crucially, uh, the Americans. Now, although the cost of reunification was a price the West Germans were prepared to pay, it turned out to be much greater than anyone had expected. In 2011, it was estimated that it had cost about 100 billion euros per year. It actually halted the German economic juggernaut in its tracks for about 10 years. Unemployment, which of course now included the former East Germany, soared to nearly 10%. It took 20 years before the economic indicators nudged back to pre-unification levels. It speaks volumes for the strength of the German economy that they were able to absorb the impact of reunification at all. Today, the German economy is still by far the strongest and the most solidly based in the Eurozone. This has a lot to do with Germany's political stability. Today, Chancellor Angela Merkel is in the 16th year of her office. Since 1949, Great Britain has had 16 prime ministers. In other words, a change every 4.3 years. In the same period, Germany, with its supposedly less stable system of proportional representation, has had only eight chancellors, a change every eight and three quarter years. Every chancellor since Adenauer has had to operate in coalitions, a notoriously vulnerable situation, yet only one was forced to resign as a result of the breakup of a coalition. And here is a promising young politician photographed 30 years ago, whom you may recognize. And as head of the Christian Democratic Party, in other words, the party that Adenauer had founded in 1947, Angela Merkel became Chancellor in 2005, and her background might have been designed to qualify her for a future political role. Her father was half Polish, so she is free of any extremist nationalism. He was a Lutheran pastor, and she's always paid tribute to the central role of Christianity in her life. She was born in Hamburg, but brought up in East Germany, so very much had a foot in both camps. She obtained a doctorate in chemistry from the Karl Marx University in Leipzig, the first scientist 
uh, to become chancellor. And of course, she's a woman at exactly the time when, a pe when people felt that a change was necessary to Germany's macho political culture. And she has moved what has traditionally been a centre-right party more towards the centre. Now, the 21st century, of course, has brought Europe many problems, notably the financial crisis of 2008, the Eurozone debt crisis of 2010, the refugee crisis of 2015, and of course now the Covid crisis. And all of those have made heavy demands on Germany's economic leadership of the Eurozone. Germany's participation was essential to any solution of these problems. Her great contribution has been to assert Germany's primacy without appearing to bully or to preach to her European colleagues. And I can't think of any other contemporary politician who could have pulled off this achievement. Here she is in 2015 at the G7 uh, summit um, with Obama, uh, President Hollande, Cameron and Trudeau. I don't think she has got all the answers right, although it seems to me that she's got more of them right than wrong. Her approach has never been doctrinaire or dogmatic. She seems less affected by issues of ego than any politician I can think of in the world today. In 2018, she said she would not stand again for the chancellorship in 2021. Some said she was making precautions to jump before she was pushed. And her departure has been flagged up for a long time. But of course, at the age of 66, she's still a babe in arms compared to some world leaders. And you may have followed uh, the rather strange process by which the Germans uh, are preparing to replace her. They've already elected a new head of the Christian Democratic Union, but that is not necessary. He is not necessarily going to be the choice even of the Christian Democratic Union for the post of Chancellor when that comes up for renewal later in the year. Um, it seems to me that one of uh, Angela Merkel's positive legacies has been to take the menace out of Germany's image in the rest of the world, something which could not entirely have been said during the 16-year term of office of Helmut Kohl. But are there people who are still apprehensive that Germany might one day again be a menace to the world? It seems to me very, very unlikely. The current constitution forbids German troops to serve outside the borders of their own country. Um, actually, that was the original wording. Now they are allowed to serve outside the borders of their own country if they are part of a UN um, sort of operation. But they're not allowed to serve outside the borders of their own country on their own behalf. Um, of course, that can change. But I don't think there's no appetite in Germany for foreign adventures. And of course, that can change too. But even if it does, I don't think that tomorrow's world will belong to minnows with populations of 85 million. In 1939, Germany was the sixth most populous country in the world. Today, it's only the 17th. By 2050, it's projected to be the 33rd. Germany will certainly have a role to play in the very different world of 2030, and it may be a dominant one, but it will not involve military domination and conquest. My expectation is that Germany's academic excellence and technological advances and cultural riches will be hugely influential. They will continue to create a climate of national prosperity, but it will not have political implications. In other words, Germany will revert to the role that it had before Bismarck, when curiously, it was everybody's most favored nation. The phoenix that has arisen from the ashes is not the Third Reich of 1939, but the German Confederation 
of 1815. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Zelaga. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Uh, very good lecture. Thank you. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. Oh. If you have a question, just raise your hand and I will let you speak. Uh, there's, a, yeah, there's a question from Christopher. Christopher, you can ask uh, your question. Thank you. Now, Christopher Wortley, I see you. So I don't see any hands, except the ones in the picture. Are they... Is it easier to put the questions on the chat line? Yes, I'm checking both. Uh, okay, fine. I'm checking the chat and the. Uh, okay. Can I ask a question? Please? Yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, Chris, uh, the refugees from North Africa, uh, Germany has about a million and a half. Has this been easily absorbed or is this a hell of a problem? It, it's, a, it's a problem in all sorts of ways. Um, First of all, it sort of gave encouragement to the other refugees to pour into Europe. And the other countries have very bitterly resented the fact that uh, they have been overwhelmed by the influx of refugees. Germany has quite successfully absorbed those 1.4 million. Um, interestingly, Hungary is the place which had the most refugees per head of population, and of course, uh, the backlash of that has been the populist government of Viktor Orban. Um, but funnily enough, Germany is managing better than anyone expected uh, to absorb these population, this population. And they do seem to find employment for a great many of them, and they do seem to be able to assimilate them into the sort of German state. Okay. Yeah, I don't see any. any are there any other no, questions? No, no. I don't see any hands up. Comment in the chat. Just one comment. Brilliant lecture. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'll just read some other other um, comments. Thank you for a fascinating lecture. Yeah, there's lo lots of uh, complimentary comments in the chat, but no questions. Good. Okay, Zelaga. Okay, well, thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. And thank you to participants uh, uh, for listening and Chris for a very interesting lecture. And just for those of you who may not be aware, tomorrow uh, Chris Dandiger will also deliver a lecture on um, Germany again, but this time it will focus on the rise of Hitler.